uh, who is tuning in and a greetings. And uh, it's a great opportunity to open up God's Word again, uh, to hear the truth and to be built up by it. Can I encourage you to uh, grab a Bible where you are and turn back to, as we're still in holiday break, Isaiah 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Grab a Bible if you can. Now, we are continuing where we left off last week. We really just introduced the chapter of uh, this great prophecy, and I want us to keep working through it. Uh, So if you didn't tune in last week, maybe you might want to pause uh, this stream and jump back to last week, the 5 p.m. service, and watch that first so that you can get the richness of the context of what's going on here. So Isaiah chapter 42, we'll read the passage again, verses 1 to 9. Isaiah 42, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Join me as I pray. Our Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to open up your word. And we thank you for this great privilege that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of technology and the opportunities that you provide. And yet, Lord, in all of this, our hearts are still saddened. And it's still difficult times, Lord, uh, where we can't be together and we can't meet. And you know it all together, Lord. Pray that you might be pleased. Lord, to accommodate to our situation, you know all things, and I pray you may speak to us through your word. We need to hear from you, Lord. We need the truth that is able to renew us and transform us in our minds, in our lives. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, uh, as one Puritan said, uh, may I fire the bow, but may you direct the arrows in between the gaps of the armor. And Lord, you are able to break the hardest of hearts. You are able to bring down the walls that we set up. And you are able to encourage those who seem to find no encouragement. Lord, may you be with us. May your spirit be attending the preaching of your word. And may your son be exalted. May he be delighted in what happens in the preaching and hearing and receiving of your word. Lord, we pray all of these things and ask for your help because we desperately need it. And we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're back in Isaiah 42. And in Isaiah's day, the world was in crisis. There was trouble. There were superpowers. There were dangers on every side. The world was in crisis. Israel was in crisis with exile. And what did Israel do? They turn to idols. What did the nations do when trouble and worries came? They turned to idols. So the context of chapter 42 was 41, where the people turned to idols and God denounces the idols for what they are. This is what people always do when crisis hits. This is what people always do when there is trouble. We mentioned last week uh, when 9-11 happened and the planes went into the building, it says that the churches in America were filled after that event, that there was a revival in religion 
people, when there is crisis, they turn and look for help in all kinds of directions, in all sorts of things. But here in Isaiah 42, God directs the attention of his people and says, Behold my servant. He calls to the nations, Behold my servant. He was going to do something in the coming days. And he wanted to turn people's attention to something else, to someone else. And we saw that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first four verses that we saw last week, if I can recap in 30 seconds, we saw uh, what God said his servant, when he arrives, will not do. And so what he would not do is he would not crush the weak. He would not trample those who are struggling and who are broken. He would not cast them aside. He would be gentle and humble. He would be meek and he would be a lifter of the lowly. And then we saw what the servant would do. And, and Isaiah gave a really broad portrait of that, establishing justice on the earth, bringing about justice and the truth of the gospel to every part of the world. He gave us a broad lens view of what the Savior would accomplish. But here in the rest of this prophecy, he zeroes in. So we get to see a little bit more of how this great success comes about. So we're going to jump in from verse 5. So firstly, I want us uh, to consider, first point this evening, the reliability of the promise maker. The reliability of the promise maker. So in verses 1 to 4, God was speaking about his servant. He was talking about the servant that he would send. Now in verses 5 to 7, God speaks to his servant. This is a, a conversation in heaven that is recorded and announced through Isaiah's lips. Now, look at verse 5. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Now, this is a brief pause in the prophecy that God is giving about his servant here. Yahweh God, as he identifies himself, wants to draw attention to what he did in creation, to his work of creation. So that first verse in five, verse 5, God says, I am he who created the heavens. Now, this refers to the sky, where the clouds are, where the rain falls, where the snow falls down, where the lightning comes down, that upper region. But notice the plural there of the word heavens. It's referring to that region beyond our atmosphere. It's referring to our solar system, the upper world, as it were. It's referring to the Milky Way galaxy, that one galaxy out of millions of galaxies. And that galaxy is filled with stars, millions and millions and millions of stars that no one could tally, and stars that each of them distinct in beauty, in shape, and design, in form, divinely crafted. And there are trillions of them. And what's interesting is there are trillions of stars that human eyes will never see. There are stars so far beyond us that only angels can look into them. And there are stars so far beyond that and so glorious that only God can see them. And yet, for each one, God has made for his own good pleasure. And he calls each of them by name, and each of them have their own task to bring glory to God. He knows each of them by name. Remember what Isaiah says in a couple of chapters back, chapter 40, verse 26. God says, lift up your eyes and look at the heavens. Who created all these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The creator of the heavens. And it says in, in verse 5 there, He who created the heavens and stretched them out, literally spread them or stretched them forth. Now this is common imagery in the Bible to describe the heavens, that they are stretched out. The imagery is like a map that has been wound up and then it's taken and it's spread out, stretched out, rolled out as it were. And that's how it refers to what God did to the heavens. He rolled them out, stretched them out. That's why when you get to Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, when it talks about the end of the world, Revelation 6.14 says, The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. 
So he stretched them out, and when everything's finished, when he says time is up, he is going to roll them back up and close the heavens. So he who spread them out, who has the power and authority to stretch out the heavens, he also has the power and authority to one day roll them up. So God mentions that he created the heavens. And then he says in verse 5, who sp- He who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it. Again, spread out the language, the vast lands, the mighty oceans have all been spread out by God. Kind of laid out like a bed sheet, this great earth. And not just God laid out the foundations, the seas and the land, but notice he says there, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it. This is referring to the flora and plant world that we have here that fills the earth, that beautifies the earth with color and life. Each plant, each flower, unique in design, feature and function, different colors, different tones, different fragrances, all beautifying our world. All that comes out of the earth is referring to the vegetation world. All that springs from the earth, grains, wheat, corn, Everything, vegetables, sustaining us, vital body fuel. He brings it all forth, trees of fruits, every kind of flavor and taste imaginable with a wine from the grapevine. All that comes out of the earth, God is drawing attention to. And even that which is beneath the soil, precious stones of gold, silver, jasper, these things again that beautify our world. And within the, within the soil, beneath the earth, precious resources for living such as oil and water and precious materials so that we can build up this world of rock and stone and materials useful for us. Everything that comes out of the earth, he made it, he put it there. But he had more than made more than that. It says, He who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. This refers to every creature that has flight in the sky, every, every beast that roams the earth, and every sea creature in the watery underworld. He made them and He formed them. There is that 1848 children's hymn that we like to sing to our kids at home. All things bright and beautiful. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. From the mammoth whale to the tiny tadpoles, to to the mighty lions, to the dainty ladybugs. He made them all. And last but not least, rather the actual pinnacle of his creation, his very image bearers, humanity, us. You and me, he made us and he gives us physical strength. He he gives us rational minds to think. He gives us a will so that we can act. He gives us consciences so that we can live and understand moral truth. And he generously gives us gifts and skills and abilities that are as numerous as as the sand, and he gives us possibilities as numerous as the stars in the sky. He gives life and breath to all. In verse 5, he gives life and breath to all, which means he also sustains all of it. Not only does he make all of this and give all of this, but he sustains it. How, how great and incomparable is our God. Truly, he is the fountain of all being the true fountain of all life, like that other old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Yet we have to ask as we hear verse 5 of this prophecy in Isaiah 42, why the sudden detour? Why the pause in the prophecy? Why this all of a sudden random tour of the universe and uh, exhibition of the earth? Why does God do this and why does he let us eavesdrop on this conversation between the Father and the Son? Well, remember what God has just promised in the previous verses. He is going to bring through his servant justice to the nations, justice in the whole earth. From every corner of the earth, people will be saved. He has is, he is mentioned this and the promise seems too impossible 
I mean, justice over the whole earth, people saved in every part of the earth. It just seems too impossible. It's a promise that seems outrageous, kind of like the spouse who says to their lover, I promise you, I'll never let anything bad happen to you. Well, well, that's just a promise too great, a promise that we can't actually make. And the promises at the beginning of this prophecy, they seem too great. And God pulls everything back and he reminds us who the promise maker is. Who is this promise making God? Do you see what he's doing here? The same God who created the universe and everything in it. He is able to fulfill the great promises of this prophecy. The same God who sustains the stars and all the creatures on the earth can sustain his servant to ensure that the mission is a success. You see, this little detour in verse 5, it's not random. It's not just randomly inserted here. It is to remind us who this promise-making God is so that we can have faith in the promises that he has made here of what he would do in his son. So first here we see the reliability of the promise maker. Next, I want us to see the promises he gives to encourage his servant through trials. Promises to encourage his servant through trials. And look at some of these promises. Look at the beginning of verse 6. I have called... Uh, sorry, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you. Now, again, don't be mistaken. God the Father is speaking directly to his son here. He's speaking to Jesus. These are words from the Father to the Son. And he says, I have called you my son in righteousness. God, who is righteous, has called his son for a mission in righteousness. And so the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ demonstrates the very righteousness of God. What does Romans 1.16 tell us? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. This mission is done in righteousness. God just cannot bail out the guilty, those who are criminals. They cannot just go unpunished. The mission to save the world must be done in righteousness. So God calls Christ in righteousness to win righteousness for guilty people. Now remember verse 1 What we saw last week, verse 1, here is my servant whom I uphold. We didn't flesh that out last week because God just says that statement. But now in verse 6, he elaborates what he means and he illustrates what he means by upholding his servant. Now, verse 6 has two great promises of encouragement to Jesus from his father. Firstly, it says in verse 6, I will take hold of your hand. That's promise one of encouragement. Promise two, I will keep you. Now again, the very giving of these promises of encouragement is no subtle hint that the servant's mission will be filled with wounds, scars, and sorrows. We only need encouragement because of great difficulties. So the very fact that the father um, gives promises of encouragement to his son gives us the heads up that this servant is going to experience great trouble and sorrows. Let's look at these two encouragements that the father gives to his son. The first one, I will take hold of your hand. Now this is strongly affectionate language. I will take hold of your hand. The imagery is of a parent taking their child by the hand. And it is to to show them that if there are dangers around, that they are accompanied to go through the dangers with them. It is a reminder that they are not alone when you take their hand. And what imagery, what fitting imagery this is for the father and his son, the father taking hold of his son's hand. Now this same encouragement here that the servant won't be alone, David rested and relied on this kind of encouragement. You know it so well, Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil 
because you are with me. Asaph, in Psalm 73, after he repented of his backsliding, this same encouragement helped and strengthened him. Psalm 73, verse 23, Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand, and afterward you will take me to glory. Now Jesus, his encouragement is here in Isaiah 42, verse 6, and the Father says to him, Son, I will take hold of your hand. I will hold your hand. Jesus would need this. It reminds us of his humanity. He would face opposition at every turn. He would be assaulted, conspired against, hunted against. Satan would attack him. The Jews would attack him. They would oppose him always, the leaders, at every turn. And Satan, even after that incredible temptation in the wilderness, what does Luke chapter 4 tell us at the end of that temptation? It said, after tempting him with these things, Satan left him and waited for another opportune time. It just never ended for Christ. Even when he gets out of the wilderness, Satan was going to come back again, come back harder, come back stronger. Yet Christ had this promise of encouragement, I will take hold of your hand. And it strengthened Christ when he came to earth. He knew this verse. Look at the second promise of encouragement from the Father to his Son. I will keep you. Now this is protective language. This is really protective language. Have you ever witnessed... Uh, two children talking together, two young ones talking together, and one of the children takes one of his possessions, a toy or something special, gives it to the other child and says, here, take this, keep it safe, and whatever you do, don't lose it. Don't lose it. Guard it with your life. Same language here. I will keep you, God says. Do you see the difference between promise one and promise two? Promise one says, I will hold your hand. Promise two says, I will keep you. Holding, hand, holding your hand refers to the abiding presence of God. You're not going to be alone. But I will keep you is the promise of protection. Protection, security. The father won't just hold his son's hand, but the father will keep his son, and protect him even though all the fiends of hell will come against him. The father will keep his son. And again, those two examples. When Jesus was in the wilderness, no food for 40 days, left alone with Satan as it were. Jesus could have thought, surely he's left me. Surely he's not going to keep me now. He was on death's doorstep. Or what about when he was in Gethsemane and the weight of his sacrifice was weighing down upon him? Surely it could have felt like in that moment that the Father's letting me go, that he's not going to keep me. But Christ knew otherwise, didn't he? He knew otherwise. Why? Because his Father promised him here in Isaiah 42, Son, I will keep you. I will keep you. And was God faithful to his promise? Was he? What happened in the wilderness? Well, in Matthew's chapter, it says at the end of that great trial, it says angels came and ministered to him. What about in the great trial in Gethsemane? What happened when he was in there, sweating drops like blood? What happened? It says in Luke twenty-two forty-three, and an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. God kept his son. Brothers and sisters, these are truly hard times and these are truly sad times for every single one of us. Every single one of us. We are all facing a very real virus. We are all facing dangers. We are all facing turmoil. Our world has been upheaved, as it were. There are clashes of opinions. There are clashes of perspectives and views. There is trouble. We've experienced separation from our loved ones, from our families, from our church family, from the family of God. The news on TV is only ever bad news. It's only ever bad news. Anxiety is through the roof. Some of us are facing unemployment. Some are facing real marital strain. There are work pressures. 
And now with our new circumstances, we face new temptations or perhaps for some of us, old temptations that are reinvigorated. This is a lonely time for widows and widowers. It's a lonely time for single people. These are tough times for leaders, for elders, for pastors. Never forget, we are flesh and blood just like you. These are tough times. This is a tough time and a tough world to bring children into. Some of you who have very young children, this is a difficult world to bring children into. These are probably the hardest times any of us have ever lived through, for most of us anyway. But then we read these words in Isaiah 42, I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you. And these words, this promise, these promises, they don't just come from the lips of anyone. They come from the lips of him who created the universe, the heavens, and all the stars that fill it. These promises come from the lips of him who created the earth and all that comes out of it. These words come from the lips of him who so loved the world, he gave his only son so that we would not perish, but have eternal life. What we're facing, there are thorns and briars on every single side. Every single side. But the same promises that sustain Christ through his trials are the same promises that can sustain us through these trials. I hope you receive God's word for you tonight. Receive these words from him. Firstly, we have seen the reliability of the promise maker. Secondly, we saw the promises to encourage his servant through trials. Next, I want us to see the promises of triumph over sin. Promises of triumph over sin. Now, back in verse 1 last week, we saw that God promised he would equip his servant for the mission. And we saw that in verse 1, because then it says, I will put my spirit on him. He would equip his son with the Holy Spirit. Now, in verses 6 to 7, God zeroes in on what that equipping with the Spirit looks like. He shows us what Christ will do, what He will equip Christ to do. Look at verse 6, the second half. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. A covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. This is the promise of empowerment by the Spirit. So look at that first first component of the empowerment i will make you to be a covenant for the people now covenant as we know is an agreement between two parties by which god and man can have a relationship it is that agreement and god says to his son i will make you to be a covenant for the people now that is strange language right because when we look at covenants that have come before for example think in noah's day God says, I will give you a rainbow as a sign of the covenant between us. And then regarding Israel, I will give you circumcision as a sign of the covenant between us, right? They were signs. Here, he says, I will make you to be a covenant for the people. The covenant that God is speaking of here will center on his servant. When was this new covenant Announced. When did it come about? Well, it came about at the servant's last dinner, at his last supper. It was announced. Jesus said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The covenant established by his blood. Jesus is the sum and substance, the ground of this covenant. It is all on him. He would represent sinners. He would die for sinners. He would be raised for sinners and he would become our righteousness. Jesus did this. And so we are in covenant relationship with God because of Jesus. The covenant between God and his people is through Jesus. And that's why God prophesies here, I will make you to be a covenant for the people. What else does God promise to equip him for? Look at the triumph over sin. Verse 6, I will make you a light for the Gentiles. To be a light for the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles here are portrayed as those who are 
in darkness. They need a light, he says. Now, when we read Ephesians 2, Paul really fleshes out just how much darkness Gentiles are in. And he says to them, remember, you used to be foreigners to the scriptures, foreigners to the covenants, foreigners to the sacrifices. You were not even citizens of Israel. You're excluded from that. And his biggest statement in the chapter, he says this, quote, you were without hope and without God in the world. Without hope and without God. That is to be in darkness. Think back to Australian history. Think back to our country prior to settlement and even post-settlement. Australia has always been a Gentile land, a Gentile country. Now consider what Australia was like prior to settlement. Now, I'm not getting into all the things that happen at settlement, all the atrocities and all those things that happen. That's a different point. But what was religion like in Australia prior to settlement? Well, I'm sure every single one of you are aware of dream time. The dream time. What was religion like here? Our first, our, our first owners of this country who lived here, they, they worshipped the earth as it were. They believe animals have spirits and supply their needs. They believe in reincarnation. They believe this world was created by their ancestors. They were so far from the truth. They're in absolute darkness. I remember when a couple of years back when the, the new Sydney Zoo opened up near Blacktown and we went to visit with the kids and in one of the sections they had an uh, indigenous Aboriginal section where they were doing a presentation and one of the guys there gave a presentation about the dream time and about how this world works and what they believe. And I remember speaking to him afterwards and trying to share the gospel with him. And he was so far from the truth. It was, everything was just completely foreign and absurd to him that I shared from God's Word. This is what Australia was like in history. Not even close to the truth. Not even close to the Scriptures. Not even close to salvation. Not even remotely close to Jesus Christ. Paul says Gentiles were without hope and without God in this world. We needed a light. Australia needed a light. Christ came as a light to the Gentiles. What did Jesus say? Do you remember in John chapter 10 when he spoke to the Jews, verse 16, Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. He would be a light for the Gentiles. So the Gentiles would become co-beneficiaries with the Jews of the glorious new covenant. A light to the Gentiles. Remember last week, we saw that the servant will bring justice and establish justice on the earth. That is the final outcome. But how is he going to bring that about? That's the finished product. But how does he get there to that point of a whole world of justice, the lifting of the curse? How does he get there? Well, look at verse 7. God promises his servant, the son, you will open the eyes that are blind to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now, the imagery here is powerful. It's of the servant's ministry and those to whom he ministered to. Now, there's three kind of paintings, word paintings here, but they show two aspects of the human condition. Look at the first one. To those who are blind, those who sit in darkness. So the blind and those who sit in darkness are in the same dilemma. They can't see. Now, we know that Jesus physically opened the eyes of the blind. He gave those physical uh, miracles. We remember Bartimaeus and the man born blind in, in John chapter 9. That was a big part of his ministry. But this prophecy in Isaiah 42, it's focusing on a spiritual miracle that the servant is going to accomplish, spiritual surgery that Jesus will do. And so the blindness and the darkness uh, that says here that humanity is in is spiritual blindness. There is a spiritual darkness that covers and hangs over humanity. Now, this spiritual darkness and this blindness, it refers to ignorance. It refers to ignorance. For example, when you say 
that I was in the dark about the whole situation. What you're saying is I had no idea what was going on. I, I didn't even understand. I didn't know that was happening. This is complete news to me. And God says, the world is in the darkness. They don't understand. They're ignorant. It is to be deceived and have the light hidden from you. And this is because the world is filled with the lie. With the lie. Revelation 12, 9 says, So the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the world. The world. Now, the irony of deception is those who are deceived don't know they're deceived. They think they know the truth, and that's the deception. They don't know that they're deceived 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. They're in darkness. So God says here, the world is in darkness, they are blind. How is humanity blind? How are they ignorant? How don't they see? Well, they're blind on three fronts. Three fronts. Firstly, they're blind to who God is. Who the one true God is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who He is, that He is the Creator alone. That there is only one God. That He is self-sufficient. That He is absolutely holy. And that He's going to judge the earth. They're blind to that truth. Secondly, they're blind to who we are. We are blind to our own identity. We are indoctrinated with the lie that we are basically good that we have the ability within ourselves to choose whether or not we will go down an evil path or a good path. The power is ours. We are capable of both. That goodness resides in us. We are blind to who we are. And we are blind to the way of salvation. Again, we have been indoctrinated with the lie that all roads lead to Rome. As long as you're sincere, whatever you believe, it'll work out. It is true. We're blind to the way of salvation. We hear it all the time. We're all getting to heaven, except probably for Hitler. Or when a loved one dies, Auntie Jane is looking down from us and looking down on us from heaven. Or Auntie Jane has just received her new wings, right? We're blind to the way of salvation that God would just welcome everyone. Blind on every side. Now, we feel, we look at this and we feel, well, we can't say that to unbelievers when we evangelize. We can't tell them that they're ignorant. We can't tell them that they're blind and in darkness. That's not very loving. That's not how we should do evangelism. That's not very Christ-like. Jesus wouldn't do that, wouldn't he? What did Jesus say in John chapter 8 to the crowds? Verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus says, you are in darkness. Follow me and you will have light. Jesus told that to unbelievers. And Christian, think back. Think back to the time when you didn't know Christ, when you didn't walk with him. Think back to the things you considered most important in the world. What were the things that you valued and poured yourself into? What did you used to think the meaning of life was? Where was your treasure before you found Christ? We were blind. We were ignorant. We were in darkness. We thought we knew the truth, but we didn't. And then what happened? The gospel came to us. The message of Christ. Christ was revealed. The light came on. And our threefold blindness was cured. When we heard the gospel, we suddenly realized who God is. And we suddenly realized who we are. We're sinful. And we suddenly realized the way of salvation through Jesus Christ alone and no other way. And so we could sing Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. found, was blind, but now I see. So the servant will give sight to the blind, to those who are in darkness. And the servant, it also says in verse 7, will free captives from prison to release those from the dungeon. Again, this is another description of, of Adam's race and the condition that they are in. The imagery is of an enslaved people, a locked up people, an imprisoned people. It's graphic here. And God's servant is sent as a liberator to free captives. Again, this is not referring to physical slavery. This is referring to spiritual liberty and spiritual liberation. 
And this, tragically, is where the Jews went so wrong when God's servant actually came. They were looking for a physical liberation or whatever it might have been, but they didn't understand Isaiah's prophecy here. Do you remember in John chapter 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews these words, If you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That is liberation language. Jesus is claiming to be a liberator of captives here. Well, how do the Jews respond to him? Verse 33, they say to him, We have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? What are they doing? They're denying that they are prisoners. They are denying that they're in shackles. That's why they are blind, ignorant. They don't see it. How does Jesus respond? He makes it very clear. Verse 34, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You see, unbelievers not only find pleasure in sin, but they are also mastered by it. They are enslaved to sin. They think they're free because they do whatever they want. But what they do is held in bondage to the pull of sin. They are in slavery. They prefer self and disobedience over worship and obedience to Christ. So God's mission for his servant is to free people from the binding chains of sin. Now hear this very clearly. His mission wasn't just to take care of the guilt of sin that humanity has. Yes, Jesus Christ came to take care of our guilt. He died as a substitute to pay the penalty we could not pay. And he pays the price so that our sin, the guilt of it, is removed. So that we're no longer guilty before God. That was part of his mission. But he didn't just come to take care of our guilt He came to rid the power of sin in our lives. The power of it to release the prisoners and the captives. Now, if you're watching, you who are enslaved to sin, you who cannot shake the grip of sinful habits, you who are addicted to sin, you who are in chains of sinful habits and behavior, that that which is perverse, Christ came to liberate. Do not listen to foolish preachers who say things like, you're just going to have to live with that sin for the rest of your life. That's just how it is. They do not realize that they blaspheme and insult Jesus Christ. He is either liberator and deliverer from sin and its power over our lives, or he's not. These are either promises of truth for liberation from the power and slavery of sin or they're mere fables. He came to liberate us from the power of sin over our lives. And God has promised his servant to be able to set the prisoners free. If this is you, have faith in Christ. Put your trust in him and he can break the shackles. That's why he came So these are promises of a servant's triumph over sin. Well, just lastly and quickly, the promises should lead to worship. These promises should lead to worship, and we will finish up here. Verses 8 following, again, is a change in whom God is speaking to. He was just speaking directly to his servant. Now God speaks and turns to the nations. Look at verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. He reminds them of who his name is. Why is he doing this? Remember the context is Israel and the nations are in idolatry and God wants to distinguish himself and separate himself from all the false gods. He hates it when humanity seeks hope in false gods. He hates it when humanity worships false gods. He hates it when we give praise to idols and other things. And that's why he says this. Because there is hope in no one else. No one else is worthy of worship. And he alone is praiseworthy. And so God separates himself and distinguishes himself. 
Look at verse 9, how he shows his supremacy. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. God points back to the former things. What are these former things that have come to pass? The prophecies in the previous part of the book of Isaiah. God promised that Babylon would, would bring them into exile. And it happened. It came to pass. God promised that Cyrus would come and he would liberate Israel from their exile. And it came to pass. What's God doing? He's having a showdown with the false gods. Just like what he did with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. This is a showdown between Yahweh and the false gods. Idols do not talk, but God speaks. And when he speaks, things come to pass. This is a call to repent of idolatry, to sever all marriage bonds with idols, and to believe on Yahweh God. And look how he shows the contest will be shown to be no contest at all. Verse 9, And new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. See, new things, there are greater things to come, and I'm going to tell you before they come to pass. What are these new things? What's the prophecy here in Isaiah 42? That he's going to send a servant who will liberate the world, who will save Gentiles as well. Gentiles will come and worship on his holy hill, just like Jews will, and he'll establish justice. God is making a decree that a new exodus is coming. A far greater exodus from slavery is coming. And God says, before there are any signs of this deliverance, I'm announcing it now. I'm announcing it now. And so this is what makes the prophecy so extraordinary. Israel is at an all-time low. The world is at an all-time low. There is so much darkness in Isaiah's day. And yet this announcement comes that salvation and liberation and, and hope is coming. And so centuries later, after God announces it, in a little town of Bethlehem, a servant is born. His own son comes who would defeat death leave a mortal wound in the ancient serpent and he will set sinners free. And so when you read Isaiah 42, it's so accurate. It's almost as if this prophecy in Isaiah 42 was written after Jesus' resurrection. And thus, God gets the glory as the one and only true God who tells the end from the beginning. Let me close. Isaiah 42 is the prophecy of of the glorious mission of salvation by grace alone. What's the fitting response to God and his servant? What is the fitting response to so great a salvation? Well, I've got good news for you. You don't have to work it out. You don't have to try and come to the answer yourself. Look at verse 10. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them. God wants people from every corner of the earth, from every country, every nation. He wants them to sing to him and he wants them to sing to him a new song. God was doing a new thing. God was bringing in a new covenant. God was creating a new people and therefore it's only fitting that a new song should be sung unto him. And the new song is to be from every tribe and language. What do we read at the end of our Bible? What do we read in that heavenly choir in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people. Who? People from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve God, and they shall reign on the earth. That song answers every single dimension of the prophecy in Isaiah 42. A new song, people from every tribe and tongue and nation, salvation won by the servant, the blood of the lamb, a new covenant and justice on the earth because God's people will reign on the earth. There's the new song. And so you are listening. In a world of crises, in a world of trouble, don't go running here. Don't go running there. Don't go reading all of these things. Don't try and fix the situation. God says, behold my servant. Behold my servant. He is sufficient. He is sufficient. Let's pray.
Lord, as we consider this great prophecy, truly the only right response is to sing a new song, a song about your grace, a song about the greater exodus that Christ won, a song about a new people created, people of every background, every tribe and tongue, people from every part of the earth made into one family. Oh God, I pray as we move forward that this song would be on our lips, the song of salvation by grace alone through Christ Jesus alone and by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We thank you for what you have done and you have proven yourself. You have shown yourself even this evening to be the one and only true God and that there is salvation in none other. Lord, may our hope be fixed and centered upon the servant whom you sent into the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to each of us this evening and the coming week. Amen.